<laughs> and then I, I will go into the hospital and I was like, oh, I really want to go like, look, I can do something funky. <laughs> Someone told to me that that if you were like, go to chill number three. And like the first thing I thought of was, I was like, wouldn't you like the shirt? And he was like, no. And I was like, oh, I thought you'd like the thing. And I was like, no. And I'm thinking, how does this thing work? Anyway. Anything I can do? Anything more? No, I don't know what you do. Hopefully, it's fine. Thank you. Hey, good morning, folks. Welcome to IETF 117. This is the Benchmarking Methodology Working Group, or BMWG, just in case you weren't sure where you were. Um, I am apparently supposed to remind us that the way we do our blue sheets is by scanning that QR code and uh, saying that you're here because we haven't been getting accurate stats. And for BMWG in particular, that matters because when we weren't doing our blue sheets, we would get really small rooms one hour on a Friday, which is no fun. So please sign in, uh, take a log in through the QR code. It'll ask you to log into data tracker or, or sign the sheets as Warren is. Uh... It's just has a QR code. Oh, it is a QR <laughs> Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, this is my first meeting in, four, in person in four years, y'all. So bear with me a little. I am not used to, uh, to chairing in person anymore, it seems. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who I uh, colossally confused last week, I apologize. I told some of you that we were meeting last week on Wednesday at 9.30 PST. So just in case, I put the date and the time on here. Uh, so no confusion. Uh, I'm one of the co-chairs, Sarah Banks. Uh, I have a chair here with me for Al Morton, who was the co-chair here for 20 years. He made me his co-chair. Um, as some of you might have noticed on the, the mailing list, I shared the, the note that he had passed back in early June. Um, but uh, we're going to say he's here in spirit with me today in the chair that I actually usually sat in. He always sat in this position. Uh, so Al's going to chair the meeting with us uh, in spirit, so to speak. And then uh, really co uh, following a, a format that I really like that Al did, uh, we always closed out the slide by saying, hey, if you aren't subscribed to the BMW G mailing list, you probably should be. Uh, we work out consensus and adoption on the mailing list, so please subscribe. Oh. So I'm sharing the slide. So the question is, how do I make it go to the next one? Oh, too far. Oh, there we go. There we go. All right. So this is our note. Well, I'm not going to read it to you. These are the rules that we uh, abide. Rules the that we abide. I don't have my mic on. I don't think. <clears throat> it's super weird to hear yourself. Um. So I'll let you read through this, but I, I want to so let you read through this, but I, I want to keep it. I, I think I, I muted him. I hope I didn't. Okay, good. Um, so one of the things that my very first IETF meeting when I walked in, Al would say, hey, welcome to BMWG, the kinder, friendlier side of the IETF. Uh, and he's really morphed that over the last 10 years that I've been, or 15 years here uh, with him. Uh, to say we work as individuals and we try to be nice to one another. And that's, it's not that other working groups don't, y'all, they do, but we really, really are kind. <laughs> we really are nice here. Uh, so, hey, welcome. Uh, welcome to the kinder, gentler side of the IETF. This is BMWG. So, as I mentioned, Al uh, passed, I think, June. Uh, June 9th, it's right there. This is the um, obituary that his wife shared so you can uh, learn a couple of new things if you didn't know. 
Uh, I did know, but I had forgotten. Al has a twin brother who I never met. That would have been really fun to come to BMW GNC to Al sitting up front. I think that would have been fantastic. Um, he had a big family. He had a long career in standards. Uh, so <clears throat> as a product manager, one of the things that I always do is look at your speeds and feeds or your data sheet, so to speak. And so if I were to put that in the context of what Al did from a standards work, uh, Al published his first RFC in 2002. Oh my gosh, that was before I was even here at the IETF. Uh, he published his last one in May of 2022. So a 20-year span of RFCs for which he published 42, uh, and he had 56 expired drafts. So he contributed a lot to BMWG. Some of you might know IPPM is our, we call it our sister working group. BMWG is all about testing in the lab. Uh, IPPM, uh, we, they don't have that restriction. Uh, and it wasn't just that Al had a prolific uh, impact on the IETF with all of his contributions. He also contributed um, heavily in ITU. He was a, a, an SG chair there. Uh, when I first came to the IETF 15 years ago, he asked me if I was going to meet him at the next IEEE meeting, for which I said, no, thank you. <laughs> and he had most recently joined the Broadband Forum, which is a, a place where I spent my early career as well. Uh, and he recently joined there. So Al had a huge impact, his love for testing and uh, characterizing the performance of how things worked uh, spans a really long career. Uh, and while I have 15 years under my belt with Al, Scott Bradner, who is the, I think the original chair of BMWG, and I think me, Al came in after Scott, uh, Al did a, when Scott retired, Al did a fantastic uh, send off for, for Scott that I just thought was, was so lovely. So Scott's here with us today and, and wants to say a couple of words and hopefully Scott, you're able to unmute and, and do that with us. You're breaking up a lot. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, so a little bit of history first. Um, Benchmarking Methodology Working Group was formed in um, October of 89. It came out of some work I had been doing at Harvard. At a, I'd set up a test lab to uh, test the performance of switches and routers and bridges and things like that. Um, that was the IETF chair heard about that and asked me to form the working group, which I did. Um, so it was chartered October 1st, 1989. I was chair for a few years, but then I joined the IESG and they're not supposed to be a working group chair when you're on the IESG. So uh, I turned, uh, turned it over, I think, to Jim McQuaid, um, who then turned it over to Kevin Dubre. Um, Kevin, 20 years ago now, March 2003, asked Al to come on as co-chair. Uh, over that time period, uh, and Sarah came on 10 years later as, uh, as co-chair in April 2013. This is according to the mailing list, but the mailing list actually doesn't go back very far. It only goes back to 96. Um, it doesn't go all the way back to the beginning. It's incomplete. Uh, Sarah was just showing the, the chart of uh, RFCs and all. I did my own little chart there. That Al was BMWG chair for 20 years. During that time, 30 RFCs were published, uh, which is double the rate from before he became chair. Uh, he was chair or co-chair. Um, he's a great guy, an absolutely great guy. Very, very knowledgeable about the field, but just interested in lots of things. One little example was that... Um, I'm part of a ship model club and I, I run the Zoom sessions for the ship model club and I by accident sent, sent Al an invitation to one of our meetings because I have another um, uh, Morton in the ship model club and I just messed up the email addresses. But he responded and uh, said he would like to come even though he doesn't do ship modeling. Um, and he did. He attended and he asked a few questions and it was just fun. He was just a nice guy doing that sort of thing, but stupendously competent um, and of remarkable good humor in the face of uh, the IETF politics and everything else. So I, I miss him greatly. Um, I observed the uh, BMWG mostly um, from the ISG and then after the ISG as an individual 
watcher, not a not much of a contributor. Um, but Al was there to friendly face whenever I showed up, um, and just wanted to talk. Uh, it's just a great guy, and truly miss him. He's done wonderful things for wonderful things for the IETF, and oh, outside the IETF as well. We know, as I mentioned, but um, just. It was a huge benefit to the IETF for for him to be as part of it and be willing to to be a bureaucrat and the uh, as as part of the process. A lot of RFCs came out and they're good, and that's thanks to Al. Here, here. <clears throat> we have Joel joining us at the microphone. Yeah, uh, Joel Yegley. Um, I was uh, ops and management AD for four years. Um, I think one of the things that uh, I took away uh, from from Al was that we, when you start as an AD, um, you uh, th may think you know the IETF process, um, but you are, comp you know, and I've been here for uh, 15 years before then. So, you know, I've run a few documents through things. It, you really depend on the working group chairs who have done this before, who have uh, experienced the whole thing, and um, who run their process to do it. Um, being an AD is a middle manager position, and um, you know, as with any company where like the very senior people may not actually have official titles, or may not have titles that. Uh, represent what they do. The very senior people in the ITF um, are around. Um, they are mentors and they're working on various things. And Al was um, one of those people for me. Like uh, BMWG is not necessarily the core of like IETF activities, but um, you know his input and judgment and. Um, um, statesmanship uh, was definitely present, uh, and I learned a lot from him. So, like, yeah, that was that was very formative for me. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I yes, and right. I I definitely took Al's approach and leadership style in BMWG to heart, both as a participant when you go into other working groups. Uh, and folks are at the microphone line screaming. We never have that happen in BMWG at all. Uh, but he often used to tell me, we have a lot of first time attendees, first time RFC or draft writers here in the room. And that really informed how I came at the now defunct RSOC as a member and then as chair, um, really protective of folks who were here for the first time because it's something we talk about a lot as an IETF group that we want. Uh, but this working group really has a lot of, of us who come for our, in my first time at IETF and my first draft was in BMWG. So I'll, uh, I'll leave really big footsteps to follow and aspire to, I, I think. Please. Yeah, there's very little I can add to what Joel said. Um, you know, this working group was always very low drama, largely, I think, because of Elle's way of running it. And when a new participant joins, I often suggest that they come here to sort of get a nice friendly introduction to the IETF and sort of get their feet wet because it is always just such a low drama friendly working group and largely I think because of Elle's steering and you will be yeah. dearly missed. Very much so. All right. <clears throat> so another Al-ism was the agenda slide where, hey, we have the agenda slide. He'd ask, hey, does anybody want to bash? Uh, I don't think in my 15 years of attending BMWG I've ever seen it happen, but please feel free. Um, we usually ask for note takers. I also did a skill that I learned from Al, which is for folks who hang out here early, not to scare you off, we'd, uh, we'd convince you to sign up. And I'd like to thank Paolo, who is going to be one of our note takers today. Thank you, sir. Uh, if somebody could log on to the Jabber uh, and take, do we still do Jabber with the Meet Echo client these days? Not ready. Somebody's in the room that helps just in case there's like to let people know that you know somebody's like a clock here in the middle. Mm -hmm. So if there is somebody that helps with clock here in the middle. Yeah, if somebody could log into the Jabber just to see if we run into that, that would be. Yeah. 
Zo- yeah, the Zulip client I saw. Yeah, or the Zulip client, my bad. I'll change that actually next time. Uh, we went through the note well, and there have been no declarations of IPR. Again, I think in 15 years, my 15 years here, we've never seen an IPR declaration. Um, getting into the status before we get into the actual work, I, I, I know 9411 was published, and Al announced that at IETF 116, but I just wanted to say, hey, with COVID, we saw a huge slowdown in a lot of the work on on the BMW G side of the house. I, I haven't checked to see if that's true of the IETF or not, but for sure in BMWG it is. So I thought I just wanted to say hooray, congratulations to the authors one more time on RFC 9411 being published. Um, we have pretty much the exact same drafts. and propo- So there's t- uh, two sections that we usually run the agenda in. Hey, let's go through an update on the drafts. You see the two here. Both of those will have an update. You see the proposals. Those are the same proposals that we had in 116 as well. I think we're going to see a couple of new ones at the next meeting, but for 117, this is where we're at. And we do have a presentation from Vladimir. Uh, he had announced it on the list, but didn't get it presented at the hackathon. So I asked him if he would um, present it here, because I think another legacy of Al was if somebody has gone and tested something in the lab, bring it in and show us. It's usually some of the most fun times that we have in the BMWG is when somebody brings in test results and we get into the, oh my gosh, that's cool. And how did you do that? And, and the questions that come out of that. So we have one of those at the end. Any bashing before we move? Perfect. Bratko, are you on? Uh, yes, I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I'm going to pull up your slides one moment. Okay, now I see it. Uh, so I think let's go to the next slide. Uh, so uh, I try to put uh, all the new information uh, to this slide. Uh, the other two you, you will see are mainly examples. So uh, the big update is uh, there is uh, another draft version uh, published, uh, 04. Uh, my goal for it was to make the terminology uh, final. I don't think I uh, really achieved it fully, but uh, this is close to what I imagine it will be in the uh, final version. Uh, uh, in the previous uh, meeting, uh, I showed in the presentation uh, some enhancements. So now they are a part of the uh, algorithm uh, official. So uh, binary search with loss verification can now be achieved just by putting appropriate uh, inputs to the ML search algorithm and it will do its thing. Uh, talking more about uh, the terminology, uh, sadly, Maciek did not have uh, enough time to review it. And uh, I, as uh, I know him, he will uh, disagree with some of them. And uh, so that's why I can tell that there will be some changes uh, in the 05 version the plan for the next meeting, but I hope there will not be big uh, some. Uh, basically, the, I do not plan to add anything. I only plan to rename and uh, maybe delete. Uh, uh, and uh, also, also there will be some uh, additional uh, sections uh, that were not part of my focus uh, for uh, this meeting, but uh, they are still missing. Uh, and uh, I'm still not uh, sure about an example. Uh, uh, later in this presentation, I will show you what I mean by example. Uh, but yeah, that is uh, for the next version uh, for the for the next version to decide. And I'm not sure I mentioned it here. Yeah, uh, omit it internally, entirely, or optional. I think uh, the current terminology is maybe too large. Uh, there are some terms that I don't think are really needed uh, for the draft. I mean, if somebody wants to implement uh, MLS, they will probably need to have something like that, but uh, it is not required. Uh, yeah, so we'll leave it at that. Uh, so uh, 
uh, when asking for your feedback. Uh, I'm not even sure uh, everybody needs to look at the current terminology just because uh, uh, I imagine there will be some edits, but uh, if anybody is interested, feel free to look at it. Maybe you will have some ideas about how to make it shorter. Mainly that's my focus, make it shorter so that it is easier to read and it's easier, easier to comprehend. Next slide, please. So Bracco, before we move, I, I did have some feedback there. <clears throat> Two things, BMWG often separates the methodology from the terminology. And even on list, I saw you struggling with trying to keep the terminology smaller so that the document's readable. But two things, I'll go back through when you have the updated draft and read it again to see, hey, should you pull it? Um, and the reason I'm saying that and, and create a separate terminology draft. And the reason I'm saying that is for better or for worse, when I do a review on Opster for IESG, when the documents are going through the, the process for RFC, um, I'm a big fan of having readable drafts. And honestly, I find it really super annoying if I have to go pull 10 different RFCs to, full a, uh, to find the definition of a term, where if you just put it here, it would have made reading through this RFC so much easier. Uh, and my recollection from reading your previous draft was that that was true here, that having the terminology you had, I found made reading your draft really approachable and easy to consume. So I'm happy to go through and read again uh, when you have your updates from uh, the renames that you were talking about. But you should, uh, I'm proposing that you consider uh, potentially keeping your terminology but separating it into a separate document if you're finding it too big. And it's just a suggestion as a participant, it's I, I, we don't mandate anything as, as chair. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it does. Uh, I think uh, like two draft revisions ago, I, I had uh, similar ideas, but I think uh, the terms uh, I was thinking about separating are already at the minimum. Currently, uh, the terms uh, I am thinking about are really tightly related to the description of the algorithm itself. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think the terms I have currently problem with should be separated, but maybe some other terms that I think are fine, then they, should, they could be separated. I okay. will think about it. No problem, thank you. Okay, so this is an example I basically picked the most complicated term from the terminology. This is uh, what it currently looks like. Uh, the blue part, uh, well, there, there are some typos and things like that, but the uh, blue part is uh, the thing uh, that should be exact, short, and uh, this is the thing uh, that you really need. Uh, then there is a gray part, which I think is interesting, but uh, maybe it does not need to be this close to the definition. Maybe this can be put to another chapter talking about design ideas and why we decided to do this thing and not that thing. I don't think it is useful enough uh, for all the people. For, for some of the people, it is interesting and maybe it is good to, to have it this close, but for other people, they will just skip, skip it. So. Uh, this is one thing I'm thinking about. And uh, the red part is a typical example of complications uh, that probably do not need to be stated at all. This is related to the minimum load and everybody can imagine uh, there is some minimum. I mean, you, if you send zero packets, you, you are not measuring enough, anything, but uh, those details, I don't think uh, need to be mentioned in, in in the draft at all. Uh, but uh, in, in this uh, terminology, when I was not entirely short, I put it there. So in some places, having a minimal load for the, for the measurement was useful. And it is always easier to just delete a bunch of text than to think about where, where you need to add a text. So this is an example of improvements. I expect for the 05. Next slide, please. And uh, this is 
well, I, I try to create a like, very small uh, example of uh, what does uh, an actual search look like, showcasing uh, the new uh, input uh, arguments. I'm not sure if, if uh, this is a good example. I think it is uh, too long, like too many measurements where trials uh, were executed and uh, maybe not enough uh, columns uh, to describe what is going on inside the algorithm. But at least uh, this is something that can become an example. And uh, basically one way to help people understand uh, what all the definitions mean is show how they uh, affect the, the the search, uh, the results. Uh, how does it? How does the uh, algorithm decide which number to pick for the third column? Uh, TL means uh, trial load. So there are some numbers. Uh, the algorithm is doing this its thing, following the definitions and uh, picking up the numbers. And the colors, red, green, and orange, show whether the loss is high or low or medium, and it converges uh, to results. I'm not sure if uh, I need to go through the detail, uh, talking about uh, all the steps uh, it is here. So if somebody wants to ask something specific, I can use this table to showcase uh, some logic, uh, what happened, what doesn't happen. And uh, the big thing is exceed ratio. So sometimes you see the algorithm measures multiple times at same load and uh, same traffic duration because the input arguments tell it the data that is discovered currently is not enough and it needs to confirm or basically it needs more inputs to, to continue the search. Sometimes uh, one trial is enough, sometimes it is not enough, and it is all uh, all governed by the new input argument, uh, which is called exit ratio in this case. And this is how you get the uh, behavior of this uh, binary search with trial verification. And yeah, next slide, please, which is a uh, thank you slide. So that's all for me. Perfect. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the updates on your uh, terminology section. Yep. Stay tuned. All right. Next up, we have <clears throat> the Stateful Network. I think, Gabor, you usually give a... Oh, Gabor, you're online. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Okay. So uh, our draft is, I think, in its final stage before working group last call. So its title is Benchmarking Methodology for Stateful Anytex by Gateways Using RFC 48, 14, to random port numbers. Could you go to the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. So this slide is about the main idea of the draft. So we would like to achieve uh, reproducible stateful Anytex by performance measurements producing meaningful results. And uh, to that end, we would like to make it possible to carry out the measurement procedures of all the classic RFCs, like uh, throughput, latency, frame rate, uh, et cetera, with, uh, benchmark, with uh, stateful NTX by gateways, especially stateful NT64 and 44 are relevant, maybe stateful NT66, I'm not sure. And uh, besides making them possible, we also added some new performance metrics regarding Connection set of performance, connection theorem performance, and connection tracking uh, table size measurements. And also, we uh, provided some guidelines how to use RFC 4814 seven so port numbers with state for any stakes by gateways. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? I have added, uh, yeah, so this is the progress of the draft. So, our draft was adopted by the working group last summer. and. Uh, the last uh, IATF uh, meeting, we presented uh, version uh, 02, and current version is 03. So since 02, we uh, made uh, little updates only. 
we updated the, the usage of multiple IP addresses to have enough time, and we renamed the test phases from primary test phase and real test phase to test phase one and test phase two, respectively. You will see next uh, why we renamed them. Could you go to the next slide? Yes. So uh, I put in some reminder slides for those who already read the draft. And for those who are not yet familiar with the draft, we just would like to give some uh, impression about what the draft is about. So in this uh, slide, you can see um, an example uh, set up for C4 and C6 for gateways, C2 devices and the tester, the device under test. And as it is a stateful and 86 4 measurements, on the left side, you can see version 6, uh, IP version 6 addresses. And on the right side, you can see version 4 addresses. And the, the, the situation is, is asymmetric uh, because of the stateful uh, testing. So on the left side, the initiator may send a new uh, packet to the device under test. And this uh, stateful ND64 gateway uh, stores the connection in the connection training table and also makes the translation and emits uh, version 4 packets, which arrive back to the responder size of the tester. And it uh, stores the port tuples, I mean, source and destination IP addresses and so on, the destination uh, port number in state table. And after that, it will be able to send a traffic the reverse direction to. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So uh, there are two test phases. In the primary test phase, uh, uh, only the initiator can send test frames, and the device and the tests uh, collection training table and the responders state table are filled with many four tuples. And then in the real test phase, that we can use bidirectional traffic. Uh, so we named these phases as primary test phase and real test phase, because in the real test phase, we, we perform the classic tests. However, uh, the uh, maximum connection information rate uh, measurement is performed in the primary test phase. So no more we would like to call them slow, but we think it's better to, to call them just phase one and phase two. It's just a little formal change. Could you go to the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. Gabor, could I convince you to speak a little slower? We're having a hard time hearing maybe every fifth or sixth word, and it's not clear to us if it's meat echo or the microphone that you're using on your end, but uh, we hear sort of a high-pitched chirp on every fifth or sixth word. So maybe slowing down a little bit might help. Okay. I will try to speak slower. Can you hear me better now? Oh, slower is not it. It's the codec or something is making it sound funny. Can you, no. can you hear me better now? <laughs> yes, Gabor, we can hear you. Okay. So uh, I try to speak slower. It's very hard for me, but I really try. Okay. So, uh, we must ensure... Uh, two extreme situations. One of them is that all the test frames uh, make a new connection, and the other is that no test frames make a new connection. And these can be uh, ensured by the conditions on the bottom of the slide. They are written there, I will not, not read them. So could you go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, the thing which I uh, still would like to discuss is the usage of multiple network to nodes. Because uh, first we use only a single uh, source IP destination IP address pair, and we use, of course, multiple port numbers to generate multiple network flows. And it worked well with Linux. However, uh, we experienced that some other operating systems like OpenBSD is not able to set the uh, receive size scaling so that also the port numbers take part in the hash function, which uh, distributes the uh, interrupts of packet arrivals among the CPU cores. For this reason, we would like to use also multiple IP addresses. And I think it's realistic because uh, Internet Ethics also uses multiple IP addresses. So I think it's a must to be able to use not only a single IP address pair and multiple port numbers, but also multiple IP addresses. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. 
you know, is the question is how to generate multiple IP version for address six. Of course, there's no such problem with IP version six addresses because the uh, reserve range is large enough for IP version six addresses, but it's uh, not so large with IP version four addresses. So uh, there are two ranges, 198.18 and 19. Uh, dot zero dot zero slash uh, thirty four, and of course we can use both. Okay. For first of all, uh, when router testing is done, we need to use two hundred fifty six different destination networks. However, we don't do router testing, so we don't need to reserve those bits, those eight bits for multiple networks. So we have uh, sixteen, uh, right now sixteen bits for for expressing. Uh, IP addresses, and we can use both ranges on the right side of the of the drawing of the of the measurement setup because on the left side either we use IP version six addresses or uh, private IP version four addresses. So we can use all both uh, slash sixteen ranges on the right side. That, that the two make together uh, slash fifteen range. Could you go to the next slide, please? And here's the drawing that uh, you can see that, of course, uh, a stateful testing requires that either you use a stateful NAT444 or Fixco gateway, but uh, they require multiple public IP version for addresses uh, on their uh, one side link. Uh, so we need a range for that, and we need a range for the tester. So we just cut into two halves the slash 15. The range, the lower part is on the bottom and the higher part is on the top. And of course, on the left side, you can use, uh, in the case of NAT44, you can use a private IP version for the season. Please go to the next slide. It's the same as, the, as this one. So the next slide. Should, yes, it's nearly the same. Only on the left side, we can see IP version six addresses, but uh, the same version four addresses are on the right, on the right side. And if we use, uh, if we uh, just use uh, the addresses in this way, there are plenty of them, in, enough of them. And I have, could you go to the next slide? So I have implemented uh, this in SIIT work, and the code is available uh, in uh, on GitHub. So we are just uh, just uh, performing performing measuring tests, and I would like to document the results in a paper. But I think it's it it should work. And now I think uh, we have uh, hopefully found all the problems and and cleared them and discussed them. So I feel that that our uh, draft is perhaps ready for working with last call. If you believe and you agree, then you can we can. You can go to the next step and, and ask for a working group last door. This is uh, on, on the next slide. Yeah, I think having, uh, are you prepared, Gabor? Is this the, the last version you expect to have or are you expecting to make an update? Well, uh, I'd like to make a small update regarding the, the addresses uh, how we use them. It's just a very small uh, update uh, because, uh, could you go two, two or three slides back? So yeah, one more back. So here uh, I used uh, the two last bytes of the IP version four addresses. And if you go to the next slide, there I used uh, some other byte of the version six addresses, and in the draft, it has a version with, when I used the uh, two middle bytes of the IP version four addresses. And just for some implementation issues, uh, so that we can have uh, an odd number of bytes, and not even an odd number of bytes, uh, it, is, it is helpful when I generate the, the header checksum. So I just made a little change uh, in the final version of the implementation uh, compared to the, to the drawing in the draft. So I would like to make a little update, but 
just for implementation issue. And that, uh, that's it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that change. As a participant, I really like that change as well. So what I'd say is make your changes, submit your draft, and then I, so we have the latest update, and then I think it's definitely ready to go through working group last call. We just need to get folks to say, yes, I support, and and then we're, we're, we're good to go. Okay. Would that work Thank for you? you Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any questions Thanks for so Gabor? All right. Next up is containers. So I wasn't clear who's presenting this today. Is that? I will present. Ah, thank you, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. So I will present our newest update about drop, about benchmarking the working performance in container infrastructure. Uh, can you go to this next one? So first thing is uh, we would like to pay a tribute to our chair. So apart from being a great leadership and to the group, so we he kindly welcomed us from the beginning when we propose this draft and provide us many valuable reviews on the drive. So uh, it's sad to hear about that, but we all thank and miss him dearly. Next one, please. Uh, the quick introduction again about the draft is a draft aimed to provide additional considerations as specifications to guide the content infrastructure benchmarking compared with previous benchmarking methodologies of common NFP infrastructure. So the consideration we uh, propose inside the draft is first is different continual networking models based on the packet assessment techniques for continual networking, uh, which is listed in the figure and the second is a different resource computing setting that is in my huge page and other thing in the side list here. This side, please. Uh, about the development of our draft. So our draft start from March 2019 and we go we went to nine versions of cell updates based on solo idea hackathon benchmarking test for myself. And uh, so recently in the 2010 in ITF Online 6, we is the first time we received the uh, reviews from the Linux Foundation by Analytic Project guys, Sweetheart, and from the Amorton himself. And after this one, we addressed the reviews and uh, Sweetheart joined us as the co-authors and we agree on the continuous rhyme networking models consideration and the resource configuration. And it's also the first time we call the working group adoption. And uh, in our ETF 106, we, uh, we received a waiting signal to gathering more reviews about from other people inside the working group of our draft. So from 106 to 107, we received review from Gable and Bravco and inside our new version, we addressed the reviews. Next slide, please. Uh, the the uh, summary is the update. So there is a small bit about the introduction and the overview and the resource configuration to address the command from Gable and Braco. And we also reorganized the benchmarking appendix inside our draft to uh, align with the proposed consideration inside the draft as well. Next slide, please. So here's the detailed update when, when I will talk about how we uh, address the complaint from Radko and Gabers. The first thing is the introduction and overview inconsistency with the remains of draft contents. So, uh, some example is uh, Radko say that uh, both the internet interface not a good general concept for continuous networking. So we think a continuous networking plugin is a good terminology to use here. And the second is to have that uh, CNA is specific to Kubernetes. Uh, and there uh, are other container architectures and services. But uh, our point of view is that the Kubernetes is the main, the most popular architecture platform nowadays. So it is reasonable to use the Kubernetes container networking interface for the draft. And actually, all the networking models for Kubernetes right now, and also which you, you have listed inside the draft, you require some kind of Kubernetes CNI to, to work properly. And uh, the last thing is uh, 
the list of napkin model might inevitably be incomplete. Uh, for this one, uh, our point of view is that uh, the napkin model consideration list inside our draft is not just a list of continuous napkin techniques, it is a list of possible categories. So any additional technique in the future, if it happens, then it can fall into one of the considerations category inside the draft. Next slide, please. Uh, second update is about the uh, resource configuration addition. So we uh, add some suggestions from Bradco related to uh, the SUD components, the noisy neighbors, and uh, some results some should be applied to, can be applied to VM, VNA as well. So we uh, have mentioned inside our graph that Numa and CPU isolation can also be applied to VM. And other resource configuration is specific to port, so it's not related to VM. Uh, a small comment from Gabriel, he said that uh, he mentioned about the Hubert side value. So we correct this one into the current standards. Next slide, please. Uh, the third is a benchmarking appendix. So the record he suggests about the input, output, and result reporting, and putting the benchmarking result as a main draft section. But uh, we actually provide the benchmarking result in our draft as a kind of proof of concept for verifying the consideration people pose. So if everyone is a working group, uh, you see that our consideration is reasonable, is good enough, then this uh, appendix can be removed in the future. And uh, content right networking benchmarking reporting standard is our scope of the draft, so we do not consider anything about the result or reporting here. And about the packet frame size value are not provided in the benchmarking result. Uh, this command from Gabriel, we have addressed it and provide the size value inside our latest result update from this draft. Next slide, please. Uh, the final thing about we update our latest benchmarking results and reorganize to align with proper consensus in the graph. So our draft, we talking about the networking model consideration, the resource configuration. So we reorganize the benchmarking experience to show the result regarding the consideration. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, we hope that uh, with this update, we have addressed the command and the review from the reviewers. And uh, we hope that our draft is quite stable enough. So we would like to ask the adoption of the draft, the working draft, and the additional feedback and comments are welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's been a thank you to Gabor and Bracco. I read through your, your feedback. It was really good. And thank you to the authors for taking a bunch of that into consideration and updating your draft. Uh, I think we've had a decent amount of feedback on the draft. So uh, I'm happy to, after the meeting today, to ask the working list if we'd like to adopt this, uh, what that means, folks. And in general, uh, we'll talk a little bit about it at the end, is you have to read the draft. And if you support it uh, or not, you say so or not on the list. That's how we take on work. So we've had a bit of a, a challenge in BMWG over the last couple of years of just with the uh, COVID changing how we do work here, uh, folks are just really quiet, even though I see uh, off list a bunch of things happening. So uh, happy to take it in uh, and ask on the list for adoption and a gentle reminder for folks to read and, and uh, echo their support or lack of support on the list, please. Vraco, uh, I, I see, uh, do you have a, I am not sure what that icon means. <laughs> do you have a question or did you have something to, to share? Uh, it's virtual queue. Yeah, uh, ah. I have a comment. Uh, basically, I think uh, there is a value uh, in this draft, uh, but uh, currently I am not quite sure about the scope of this draft. Uh, I'm, well, uh, I'm not sure how big change in, in the scope uh, usually happens uh, when the draft is adopted, uh, but maybe uh, the scope of this draft can be cleared enough, so uh, I am less confused. Uh, my main comment uh, is uh, to compare this draft with uh, two RFCs uh, that are uh, already mentioned in the introductions. Uh, one RFC is 8172, 
considerations for virtual monkey virtual network functions and their infrastructure. And the other RFC is uh, uh, 8204 benchmarking virtual switches in the open platform for NFV. Uh, those two have the structure that I like, uh, so maybe I uh, automatically expected uh, this graph uh, will have similar structure and uh, it has not. Uh, those two RFCs uh, have a clear scope and uh, even when they are talking about uh, virtual machines and uh, vSwitches and uh, similar technologies, uh, they do not go into deep details about what is VM, how does it work, what are different approaches on uh, v, uh, vSwitches, uh, how do vSwitches actually handle packets and so on. They leave it it's quite black black box. Sometimes it is part of the system. Sometimes it is uh, the actual component we want to test. But uh, they do not try to list uh, different approaches. Instead, uh, those two RFCs uh, uh, are talking about okay. Now that we have some more structure in our SUT, which is the configuration parameters or other things uh, that should be mentioned uh, by anybody who is uh, testing such an SUT and also talking about uh, what specific new test can be done on this SUT. For example, stopping and starting VMs. So I guess uh, my expectation was that uh, this draft will be, will, will be more similar to the, those two RFCs, but maybe not, maybe uh, equivalence of those two RFCs will be in different document and this draft will have a different scope. Currently I'm not sure, but definitely uh, there is uh, value in there and uh, I think it is, it is good uh, when this group will read the draft and uh, add their ideas. Thank you. Can I ask, has anybody in the room read the draft? So I uh, mimic a little bit of what Vrak was saying too. I don't mind the scope being different, but I do think the scope needs to be a little more clear here. And so if there's a draft that you are wanting to have for a bit of light bedtime reading, I'd really recommend uh, folks take a look at this um, and share their feedback. And for the authors, um, Vratko, if I could ask you to share that feedback on the list, um, I'll share mine as well. Uh, and maybe we can sort out having a, a firm scope before we ask to uh, adopt the, the work as a, a draft. Does that work for everyone? Works for me. I'm going to take silences. Yes, thank you. Any questions before we uh, move on? All right, thank you, sir. On to MPLS segment routing, for which we have Paolo in the room. Oh, our note takers in the room. I will help you out while you're presenting. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Turn it on, please. Oh, all right, I yeah. think it works. OK, so I think Giuseppe is also contributing to the notes. Mm -hmm. OK, so um, benchmarking methodology for MPLS segment routing. Uh, basically, I'm presenting on behalf of the notable co-authors you see listed here on the cover page. Uh, next, please. So let's uh, recap uh, what we are doing with uh, our draft. So basically, you see, we are speaking of one of the two flavors of uh, segment routing. Uh, the idea is that we'd like to um, uh, exploit the capability of uh, SR, um, meaning that uh, uh, SR leverages the source routing paradigm, so you basically instruct a node, the add end node, with a policy to take action and, let's say, uh, steer the packet. Uh, the advantage of segment routing is that you, did, you do it on the head end, so the, the state is maintained only on the first router of the chain, the other simply uh, can 
uh, steer the packet according to the policy. The policy basically is a, is a uh, set of segment identifiers or SID, and that's let's say the key for packet steering. Now, um, that's the general behavior. Then for segment routing, we have two flavors, two data planes where we can instantiate that behavior. So one is segment routing over MPLS, which is the subject of this draft. And the other one is segment routing over IPv6, which is the subject of the next draft that will be presented by one of, of the other co-authors. Um, what's the problem here? That we don't have any, let's say, uh, benchmarking for SRMPLS. Uh, we have the benchmarking capability for MPLS, which is, uh, let's say, um, addressed in RFC 5695, but that's all. So we need to go further and, uh, let's say, um, elaborate the full set of mechanisms for having the benchmarking of the segment routing capabilities of a, uh, a network device. So next slide, please. Mm -hmm. There we go, sorry. Okay. As said, the uh, SR policy is instantiated through the MPLS label stack. So once again, we're speaking of MPLS, so we need the standard MPLS mechanism to implement segment routing. So basically, we use the, uh, the, the, the standard way, which is we do reuse the, uh, the labels currently adopted in MPLS. Uh, so a segment identifier, SID, is basically a label. Um, since the behavior is the same, there is a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between MPLS, the operations supported by MPLS, and those enabled by SR MPLS. So there are three of them. Uh, if you are familiar with MPLS, you know that there are uh, label push, meaning we put a label on top of the packet. There is a label pop, so we remove the label. And the swap, which is we uh, basically tweak the, the, the labels, and there is a change of the uh, forewarning mechanism. Uh, for SRMPLS, we have exactly the same three operation. Push, which is exactly as the name implies, label push. There is a next or label pop, and continue label swapping. Now, how to... Um, implement the benchmarking for SRMPLS. Clearly, we have to rely on RFC uh, 5695. Again, the benchmarking of a basic, let's say, uh, MPLS capable network device and do something on top of that. Um, in the draft, we propose some extensions to the basic capabilities. Uh, you see listed here just three of them, but it's just for, uh, let's say, uh, giving you a, a high level summary. So for example, test a label stack, so a seed stack, which is longer than one single label. And that uh, is recommended, let's say, to be prepared for uh, um, dealing with traffic engineering. Uh, then there is a different reporting format. Clearly, that is a consequence of the dif differences or extensions we are introducing the benchmarking. And then, um, since we are dealing with the um, dynamic distribution of the SID, we have also to consider, for example, a way to do that. So, for example, having a, a, a protocol in the control plane able to support the SID distribution. And clearly, as you see, we need to repeat the test for every single operation and see what's the, the result. So that's for the introduction of uh, SRMPLS. If it is needed, then if we move to the next slide, uh, Sarah, please, we see the draft history. So you see that basically from uh, March 2022, when we submitted the first version of the draft, to March 2023, basically we have produced six uh, different reviews of the draft. And uh, uh, I'd like to take the chance of uh, thanking uh, all the list and the contributors for the very useful revisions, the comments uh, um, that were shared. Uh, thanks to them, we have tried to improve uh, the two drafts uh, 
So both the, this one and the next one on SR uh, um, V6. Um, I skip the details, but just this is just to highlight that thanks to that, I think the, um, the, the draft have, has been enriched enough, let's say, to get to a stable uh, state, I would say. As you see, from, uh, uh, let's say, March 2023, so since IATF 116, the, the draft is uh, quite stable. We have not introduced any other, uh, let's say, modifications or changes thanks to the contribution we have received. So I would say we are ready to uh, ask for the adoption uh, uh, by, the, by the working group. And uh, sorry if you can go to the next slide. Okay, probably you remember that uh, at the F116, um, we also discussed about uh, uh, adoption of our draft. Uh, I'll suggested to have a sort of a final review, so a, a sort of confirmation uh, by the contributors, so the people that uh, provided the comments I mentioned before, uh, that those comments were actually addressed, so the content is uh, let's say, up to their expectation. Um, you remember that we agreed to have a sort of final review before moving to the adoption. Um, clearly, the loss of AL is a real loss, so that probably also, uh, how can I say, uh, stopped also the, the revision process. Uh, but basically, we are here to restate again that probably we are ready for adoption. We like to ask to the chairs and the working group if this is the case. Um, and I would say that probably the proposal uh, by Al was the right one. So if the contributors, the, the, the people who commented, are happy with the changes we have introduced across the different uh, revisions, well, probably we're here again to ask for uh, adoption. Um, there is one uh, addition I, I'd like to, to share with you that probably moving to um, work group adoption means that the, the draft also gets more visibility, clear. Um, so there is one piece that is still missing, and again, Al uh, pointed that out uh, uh, during one of the previous discussion. Um, having that draft adopted uh, probably means that people are more willing to contribute also with the, the results of the benchmarking, of the real lab benchmarking. So we can introduce also some data about the, the I would say, the real measurement. And so that, I think, is all from me. I think we have a, a question coming in from, or a comment coming in from Karsten. Okay, thank you. Switch it on as well. Uh, thanks very much, great work. Uh, generally, I would support the uh, working group adoption. I think uh, the draft is sufficiently advanced. I have, of course, a number of questions after that adoption, but before that adoption, only one. At ENTC, we see, so my name is Carsten from ENTC. Um, we, we see that the different segment routing options over MPLS, over VXLAN, SRV6 are integrated and more and more attention in the industry is uh, acquired by SRV6. I know there's a second draft to be going to be presented here afterwards, but would it make sense, maybe a, a newbie question for me, would it make sense to integrate these two and to create one joint RFC about segment routing benchmarking? So this is a good question. And I remember it was also asked during the previous meetings. And in general, uh, the answer, not just from us, I mean, the, the co-authors, but I remember also from the chairs is to try to keep separated because they tend to be quite large. If you remember, we are, I think, close to 30 pages or so each. And the risk is that if we merge both of them, probably the draft tends to be, I would say, too big, you know, to be digested, you know. And since there are... Uh, characteristics that are peculiar to the data plane we are considering, our proposal is to keep them separated. But we are open, let's say, to, to the discussion. So if uh, the chairs have a different opinion, we are going yeah. to take that into consideration. So Sarah Banks as a participant. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, we did have the conversation about should we 
combine them. And I definitely carry the opinion that keeping these separate because there are specifics that are different between the two. I don't want to read 60 pages and then have to have a notebook to keep track of, hey, what do I need to think about what's different here? I, I think they stand alone on their own. And it, yeah, if they were two or three page documents, then maybe I'd have a different opinion. But I definitely support I'm not super married to it, Karsten. I, I can certainly see why you might ask. Uh, but if I had the magic wand to wave, I would, I would vote to keep them separate. I certainly, for what it's worth, don't think that that hinders us taking the work on. And look, if the working group as a whole changes their vote later on, then it would slow things down. But I think it's still in scope and still worth uh, pursuing the, the effort. Please. May I, may I make a follow-up comment? Please. Okay. So uh, probably last year I would have agreed, but the number of implementations we see uh, for SRV6 are really increasing greatly. And this year in our interop event, we tested already eight vendors implementing SRV6 at a commercial scale. So I think the, um, the advantage for the working group to integrate these is A, it's the, there's, these are just different flavors of solving the same problem. So benchmarking should, should follow the same guidelines. B, vendors are turning more and more to SRV6 and integrating these efforts will also join the forces of the two working, uh, not working groups, the two teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. as, uh, as where, if we continue with separate, we will have two separate teams working on things. Yeah. And C, it also will create a consistent methodology. I'm quite worried that we will have the fine details of like SRMPLS methodology, benchmarking methodology and SRV6 benchmarking methodology be not really consistent with each other. And uh, that would have been my comments, which I will not make right now, but uh, in the section which described the actual work where we in the RC 9411 spent years, you know, <laughs> of refining things, uh, these are all still missing. Right. So how exactly is the push and the continue and next tested? That's not mentioned at all. The only thing is, oh, we're referencing the old RFC from, from MPLS benchmarking, but it's not going to do the deal, right? to cut the deal. So I think the, the, the majority of the work coming up will be on like, how do we actually test segment routing? And yes, probably there need to be different chapters for SRV6 and SRMPLS. But still, I think it would be much better for the working group to adopt it as a single work item and to have people join forces. I see Edward in the uh, queue. Please um, go ahead. I, I'm, I'm co-author, but I have some comment for Karsten. Uh, Karsten, in reality, the situation is a little bit worse because, uh, look, uh, to keep the document under control, to keep it small, uh, we have extracted services out of the, of the scope. Uh, in both documents, in Service X and SRMPLS, we don't have services. And you are not the only one who are pushing us uh, to, to, to merge uh, as much as possible and to create one huge document. For example, Boris is, uh, is pushing us offline uh, to ADD services, for example. Uh, and uh, okay, uh, it would be bigger. Therefore, I, I don't believe we are capable to cover everything by, by one document because uh, everything will mean not just the SRMPLS and the SRV6, it would be additional services. And especially in, in, in the SRV6 case, it would be huge number of services, it would be huge document. So Sarah Banks as a participant, for what it's worth, I'm less worried about huge documents. Uh, having said on the R RSOC for, I don't know, six years, I think, eight years, we saw documents come in from like the HTTP group, whatever they're called, uh, HTTP biz. I think they had like two or 300 page documents. So I'm less worried about the length of them in the, the sense of the length of them, but I think what Karsten says for me gives me pause because if the folks who are going to implement and go use it to test are pushing for it, I think in particular what I'm hearing is that making sure that the method, ah, one of the reasons you'd want to combine is to make sure that the methodology is consistent. So you could do that in one of two ways, either combine them so you get a, a consistent methodology or making sure that there's consistency between the two drafts. I think it's, you know, worth the authors talking and, I don't want to pressure you into, of course, having an answer today unless you do, but, you know, it might be worth having a conversation around what Carson is sharing and then circling back to say, yeah, yeah where do you land with that? Right. Maybe a quick answer on my side. Let's discuss offline. So just after the meeting, let's see all together if we 
can find more pros or cons for one solution or the other. Again, uh, we have shared our position, but we are open you know, to discuss it. And if we could share that on the list, that would be even better. Perfect. Uh, Louis, Louis, uh, Louis, sorry, uh, I see you in the queue. Yes. Luis Contreras from Telefonica. I, I, I see pros and cons on, on merging or keeping them separated, but at the end, the, the, the semi routing is a common topic, a common problem, but at the end, we are dealing with different data plane implementations. So, probably because of that, probably makes sense to keep them separated because certainly we are benchmarking different solutions, even though the problem is, is the same. So, yeah, just to comment on, on this. Yeah, I think one of the, the piece, oh, sorry, Sarah Banks is a contributor. I think one of the pieces that we'd want to have when we have that discussion on list is how do we deal with the methodology? Do we agree that it's a concern that the methodology should be consistent? And if it is, whether we, if we keep them separate, how do we have that conversation? I think that's an interesting thing for us to explore after the meeting. Sure. Perfect. Fine thing. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, thank you. Perfect, thank you. We don't ever adopt in the working, uh, in the meeting, we take it always to the list and ask for it there. Abs oh yes, I think, A, let's have the conversation we talked about offline so that we can ensure, because for what it's worth, I personally don't worry if we were to take two pieces in uh, and then decide to consolidate them later, we could do that with ease and I don't think Warren would yell at me too much and I could ply him with Diet Coke, but I do feel that, yeah, if we could sort it out before we do the working group adoption call, I think life would be easier for the authors and for the reviewers, so. So with that said, I'd say part B or part two um, is the SRIV6. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Edward, I'm, please. I'm here, yeah, yeah, I'm here, yeah, I could continue, I'm here. Uh, next mm -hmm. slide, please. Uh, on behalf of our co-authors, um, the problem of SRV6 is a little bit more complex than SRMPLS uh, because in reality, SRV6 is a combination of two things. It's a combination of MPLS, effectively. It's very similar to, to label switching. Of course, it's not label, it's a seed, but it's very similar. And at the same time, it's uh, very similar to IPv6. Therefore, it's uh, pretty much, it's, it's, it's much more complex for, the, for that reason. Uh, of course, it's based as everything else in, in this particular working group, it's based on RFC 2544. It's, it's really still the basement for everything. Even for this particular document, it's still still the basement. But additionally, it has a big influence from APV6 uh, test and uh, from MPLS test. And therefore, it's, it's, it's a little bit different mix than the previous document. Uh, of course, if we will merge, it will not become 60 page. It will be something like maybe 45. But uh, the terminology, of course, is exactly the same because we are trying to keep it very similar to 2544, to the basement. Next slide, please. A SRV6 from technology point of view is pretty much different from SRMPLS and MPLS because it has uh, formally four type of nodes. Of course, it has source, a SRV6 destination, of, of course, of course. Uh, but additionally to source and destination, we have two transit nodes, two type of transit nodes. One transit node which participate in the SRV6, uh, change pointer and change destination address, and one which does not participate. Uh, the SRV6 is capable to work over normal APV6. Therefore, intermediate node could be just normal APV6. Therefore, here we have uh, four different nodes on the picture, which is pretty much uh, different. And additionally, we have here a lot of prog programmability, uh, different it's could have very much different meaning uh, what should what should happen with the packet, especially from service point of view. And uh, it makes this particular document, mm, I would say, pretty much different from the previous one because uh, the technology is different in reality. Uh, and for that reason, I believe it does not make sense to merge it. Next slide, please. Uh, the history of the draft almost the same because we have published both at the same time, refreshed both at the same time. Uh, thanks especially to Gabor, to Boris, to Bruno, uh, who has made uh, a lot of uh, comments, and we we have changed it maybe by by thirty by thirty or forty percentage uh, since that time. 
and uh, therefore thanks. And uh, here you see some technology which mentioned here on the slide, for example, PSP, USD, USP, which is not available for MPLS or SR MPLS. It's it's really uh, special for, for SRV6. Therefore, it's not exactly equal drafts. Please go next slide. Uh, for the next steps, uh, we have a little, pro a little problem here. A little problem that we really don't have third party tests using this methodology. Uh, Al Morton told us a couple of times, uh, especially on the last ITF, uh, he told us that, uh, guys, okay, the draft looks, looks stable, but guys, you don't have a uh, third-party test. Uh, your, your methodology has not been run by somebody outside of your, of your, of your team. Uh, okay, it's, it's, it's a little bit problem. For that reason, uh, because draft looks stable, uh, looks like we have fixed everything, and looks like nobody has a new idea what to idea. A small, a small comment exists from Boris. We will address it. Uh, he sent us message offline out of out of the list. We will address what Boris uh, told us. It's it's, it's a small, small changes. Uh, but uh, except these small changes, we don't have idea what what else to change. We need really to to test it on, on some third party people who, 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 who are not participated in this currently. And if it would be adopted as a work group document, it will have more weight. Because look, for SR MPLS, as Karsten told us, uh, it's very important, many tests, many, many implementations. I would say that every year, probably we have a few thousands, limited number of thousands, a few thousands, maybe one or two thousands of tests worldwide for SR MPLS. For a service six, I would suppose a little bit less. Uh, for a service six, uh, we have something like maybe um, a few hundreds tests. But anyway, it's hundreds and thousands of tests worldwide, which is done right now. And if we will have a status of the group document, we have more chances to uh, to to ask uh, to do something like we specified in the document too. Because currently the test is done by methodology developed locally uh, for every particular situation. It's uh, test plan right now is completely different. Therefore, if we will have uh, a status, maybe uh, it will help us to we are not in a hurry. If for some reason uh, we should wait for adoption, and uh, okay, no problem, we, we could wait. It's, 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 we are not in a hurry. But uh, as Karsten told us, and, and I know this, that uh, we really have a lot of installations uh, right now worldwide. And for that reason, it makes sense to speed up it a little bit. That's it. That's it from my side. Thanks for, for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> I, uh, Sarah Banks, as a participant, uh, I'm less concerned. <clears throat> I don't know that you have to have a third party or a test vendor implementing this um, before working group adoption. In general, that's not usually how we see it happen anyhow. So I I'm, I'm less worried about that. We could certainly take on the work. And if we can't make progress forward, then we can't make progress forward. No, no problem there. Um, hopefully that, that helps alleviate some of the concern. I, I do think that the sort of feedback from the previous presentation still holds here, right? We need to have the conversation on list around, do we want to combine these or not? And I understand, I think, Edward, you just made a pretty compelling case for why you feel these should stay separate. Got it. So let's continue that conversation on list. And then the outcome of that will dictate, I think, next steps in terms of you know, do we ask for working group adoption? And if we do, is it for one or both a combined draft or, or separate drafts? And we'll, we'll know at the end of that conversation what to do there. Does that make sense? Okay, thanks. Perfect. I see Louis, Louis, how do you, how do you properly say your name? Tell me, Louis, Louis? Louis. Louis? Yeah. Bon. Thank you, Luis Contreras, Telefónica. Yeah, just to comment regarding the, the testing, basically the four, up until now has been more focused on interoperability of different implementations. So interoperability is, is uh, somehow being demonstrated now. So probably will be now the time of uh, start doing tests for more, more related to the benchmarking in order com to compare uh, solutions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just to comment that fact that probably the industry now has been just simply focused on interoperability. Now will be the time we start looking at this and, and maybe something that we can, uh, I don't know, I, I, would not say commit, but try to, to have something ready for the next ITF or uh, into ITFs, some, some results applying this, this document for somehow validating the, 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 the benchmark being described here. 
Yeah, you again, BMWG is a fan of results, so please, that would be very nice. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Any questions before we move on? Perfect. Oh, sorry. Just one more. Um, Nate Ning. Oh, Karsten from ENTC. <laughs> so, I'm, I mean, this is called a benchmarking methodology document, right? Mm -hmm. And for the stuff that I've done lately, we've spent a ton of time, actually maybe too much time, in, in ensuring that things are reproducible and that they can serve as a basis for real hard testing. Not calling it certification, but, but real for, for benchmarking where the results are reproducible. If you take the RFC and you put it to the test, then you gain get results and the results are reproducible and understandable mm -hmm. and i'm not sure looking at this document because also louis you said it's mostly for interoperability if that is the goal of this document so is it really the goal of the authors to create a benchmarking document i'm not saying to judge it in any way I'm, i just want to understand because if so then i need to provide much harsher harder comments than if it's just really just to get people familiar with the with the common problems of as say sr testing and so on uh, Karsten, uh, let, let me try to answer. I'm sure that it's for benchmarking. I'm sure about this. Uh, but I am, it, I'm asking you to read yourself. Please read yourself and tell, uh, tell is it about interoperability or is it about performance? Please read yourself. He, Karsten is saying he did. So, look, I'd say I think this is a fantastic conversation to continue on list. Uh, I will say as chair, we are the benchmarking methodology working group, not the interoperability working group. So for sure, uh, it needs to be focused on benchmarking. And I didn't see that it, it veered far from that. So, you know, I, I continue to reiterate, I think the next step is to continue this conversation on list and make sure what I'm hearing are two things. A, should we combine or keep the draft separate? Uh, and B, let's make sure that the focus and folks are comfortable that the goal here is for benchmarking and that we're firmly in that camp. Yes? Perfect. Thank you. Our second to last, the ISTN. Uh, I believe, uh, and I apologize, I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce your name. Key is here to present. Uh, yeah, 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 Key. Key. Good morning or good evening. Uh, it, it's late night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. Oh, uh, well, we are very happy to be here and uh, to share our considerations on, uh, on ISTM which is uh, integrated space and uh, terrestrial networks. And uh, next slide, please. So uh, we're talking about uh, a new methodology for benchmarking because we think we are on, a, uh, we are having a new network here, which is uh, ISTN, which will network the whole world, the globe, through the uh, low Earth orbit or LEO mega constellations and the terrestrial networks. And we call it a new network because it's uh, featured by some uh, new character, characters, like it's, uh, it has global level high dynamicity and unexplored uh, environmental uncertainty. That's requiring new network designs and these designs should be uh, comprehensively and uh, systematically benchmarked in lab before we launch these satellites and these network uh, protocols into space. So we give our uh, requirements for this new methodology that should, should, uh, um, it should mimic real uh, constellation, physical behaviors, and also the uh, network behaviors. And secondly, it should support a flexible constellation scale as the satellite uh, uh, constellation is still growing uh, even now. And uh, third, it should uh, be based on or driven by realistic data and uh, test cases. And the last, uh, it should be low cost and uh, easy to use. So we didn't find one uh, sufficient ex existing benchmarking methodology. 
next step next step and on 115 we give our basic consideration which is a data driven and emulation based benchmarking approach and consisting of the next three stages the first is a community driven data collection so we will give the uh, methods to collect uh, public ISTN information, such as we can gain the constellation topology and author some user measurements requirements for the latencies and uh, uh, the bandwidth. And second, we, with the, all this data collected, we can set up a um, real data-driven ITE via virtual machine or container-based emulation and could mimic the LEO behaviors uh, like the uh, physical dynamics and also the uh, behavior changes on network level, like the link link latencies and the exact thing. And, uh, and the last, we could specify a different DUT or SUT, like uh, it's uh, if you test, uh, like you are test, you can, you can have different uh, device or system on the test, uh, like uh, you can uh, test some uh, routing uh, protocols or some transport protocols as, as different uh, protocols to to under test and uh, we um, uh, give some specific test cases and again game the results so on the last uh, time 116 we give our more detailed uh, methods on data collection and the parameter setup uh, we have just like three types of uh, data collecting methods from the regulatory data, uh, some live data, and uh, some crowdsourcing data. And the uh, next slide, please. Today, we will uh, uh, continue to uh, update towards a more concrete benchmarking methodology. So for the stage one, like uh, the data collection, we, will, uh, we have updated uh, some setup strategy with new data collected. And uh, we will also give a, a more conc concrete uh, specification on stage two, that is how to build a container-based uh, laboratory test bed. And uh, we will also showcase that uh, we have uh, how is, what is the current uh, capability of the test bed we have already built. And uh, for the and we will get also uh, talk about our future work. Okay, so next slide, please. Uh, so first, we have uh, give uh, uh, we have talked about how to set up the environment for ISTN, uh, like many parameters in last meeting. And uh, today we have two updates. One is uh, how to set up the pass uh, the packet loss ratio of the ground to satellite links, according to recent studies, and which is also aligned to our uh, real world measurement. The packet loss ratio of the ground to set as links uh, is recommended to be set dynamically even uh, during one test between zero to five percent uh, and where the higher loss ratios will occur when one ground to set as a link handover event as the satellites are um, continuously moving at high speed around the globe and the next slide please And secondly, uh, we have also given many strategies on how to set up the ground to satellite uh, connectivity, which uh, gives uh, uh, what, uh, which satellite uh, is uh, one ground satellite, uh, is one ground station is connected at each time. And uh, this time we have found uh, some other uh, factors, which is also, which is not uh, included that also affect these ground to set out strategies in real world systems like the angle of elevation of the user terminal to the uh, satellite and and the uh, zooms and uh, also uh, like how the dates of the satellite launch and the weather once that one satellite is sunlit at each moment so specifically for a specific ground station or a user terminal also on the ground, a satellite with the following characters is preferred. Uh, a satellite with a higher angle of elevation and, and, on, and with an assumes that could avoid 
interference with geostationary orbit satellites and also with newer launch dates or uh, a, a satellite who has a solar panel which is being sun sunlit now will be preferred. So these factors uh, do constitute a more complete uh, strategy and uh, optional if the data of the factors are available for, for the test. Next slide, please. So uh, the next we give uh, our more detailed uh, consideration on how to build a container-based laboratory test bed. Firstly, we will explore to the Linux containers, uh, which was talked just now, to build a, a large-scale ISTN test bed. We will have uh, each container simulating one satellite and one ground station or a user terminal. And next slide, please. And uh, we connect these uh, containers and uh, exploiting high performance cluster to build a scalable test bed. For example, to build a, as up to uh, 1,554 satellites or according to the uh, benchmarking requirement. And uh, we can have uh, multiple servers to build the one uh, large scale environment. We, uh, we also have given the, the details on how to how to connect different servers uh, in our recent paper. And uh, the third, uh, last, uh, next slide, please. And with the uh, uh, cluster and with so many uh, uh, containers and uh, connected to each other, we will dynamically adjust the uh, inter-container connectivity to satellite as the LEO dynamics as uh, the connectivity is, is changing continuously in the real world. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, with this method, we want to share that uh, uh, the capability of our current test bed, uh, the biggest uh, the, or the, the, uh, the parameter we should uh, focus is this, is the first is uh, the third column, like the constellation size. And uh, we find that to support a, a larger constellation size, we will need more like the start up creation time and uh, we will have a larger CPU or memory usage. And uh, for, a con for a constellation larger than about uh, five, uh, 600, 700 uh, uh, constellation size, we will need two or more workers to, to simulate or to build the, the basic environment. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, with, with that, we're, our next step will to uh, connect, uh, will to collaborate with our industrial partners we are now integrating our container-based satellite network simulator with other network experimentation platform. Uh, the first one is uh, a future internet technology infrastructure in China, which is a high performance platform. Country. So we, we will have many uh, uh, nodes and uh, very long distance links around uh, our country and to have some real world tests. And uh, secondly, uh, we will have an industrial partner from China Telecom. They are operating the Tiantong mobile satellite communication system and uh, we will work with them to, to test uh, uh, our methodology. And uh, so, uh, next step, please. Uh, next step, please. Okay, that's all for uh, our presentation today. Any questions, please? Uh, Sarah Banks is a participant. I continue to be really excited about this work. I think two things. Uh, as mm -hmm. a reader, I am still working towards understanding how the authors are comfortable with what they're simulating in the lab with Linux containers. 
uh, being an accurate representation of the real world when you go in and you do it uh, in the real world. <laughs> I'm not sure how else to say that. So I, I think, uh, and I'm happy to share these comments on list. I think there's a little bit of work to be done there to bring me along and, and it's not my field of expertise for sure. Um, so making sure that we understand that, yep, these are accurate representations in a lab environment is very useful. And the second thing is that I'm very excited to see that that FITI and China Telecom partnership or, or that ability to take your work in there. And I'm wondering, as you explore, as the authors explore those two opportunities, will there be any outputs from them that you'd be able to share with the group? So here's what we saw when we worked with China Telecom, any results that you could share. And again, it's just to help... Uh, move along the understanding of the work that you're doing and help drive other folks in the working group um, to be excited. And uh, sometimes we see folks from China Telecom or other folks that you're working with come in as well and join the conversation. And so I would encourage the authors to see um, if they have uh, colleagues in those two in FITI and China Telecom, if they can also come in and share their feedback, that's going to be helpful because I don't think that there's any other working group at IETF that we could send this out to for a review. So having a mobile operator share their feedback would be incredibly useful, not only for the working group to further the work, but my guess is for the IESG as they consider uh, the draft going through the RFC publishing process. That was a lot of words. Let me stop. Does that make, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. And the, and the, yes, we are. We are, uh, We have been trying to 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 answer these two questions in in our work. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the first one, and 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 actually, the uh, they are uh, they are probably one problem. In fact, we work with the industrial partners to to make the. The, the benchmarking more, more realistic. And for, uh, for, so, for so uh, our methodology is called or defined as a, a data-driven methodology. Mm -hmm. So the, the emulation part is to uh, scale the constellation size as the, the new network is uh, consisted of a very large size of, of satellites and ground stations. So we need an emulation part. Uh, and and uh, it's very hard to to, to test uh, in in reality. Mm -hmm. So the data driven part is what we are uh, utilizing to 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 try to uh, improve the fidelity. And uh, as for the ten uh, for the Tintong or the FITI or we profiti or profiti part, uh, we can have uh, for FITI we will have a, a real world very long distance links and uh, which can mimic the the, the like as a ground to set at links which is also uh, very very long and have have uh, varying varying uh, characters and for tin tone part we uh, we we can uh, through real test to get the real like uh, link parameters uh, how the, the the latencies or the the uh, other status like the the the, the law packet loss ratios are changing for for the in the real uh, space environment, and so that we can take that back into our our uh, environment and to mm -hmm. improve uh, and to to support a lot of other tests, and in we can also uh, I've. And uh, one part is that uh, when we get these inputs, like the network parameters, we build an uh, environment based on that wind and we, uh, we, and we uh, take uh, different network tests. We can also, when, when we get the results, we can also compare what uh, the results would be if we test them on the, on the real set system. And to to continue uh, just our uh, benchmark methodology, and that's my my preliminary uh, feedback answer. Yeah, no, I'm I'm glad to hear that you're you're thinking about it that way. It's certainly uh, 
you're answering some of the questions that I'm going to ask on the list. I'll ask on the list anyhow to share that feedback. And so it, it sounds like you have the first part of my ask under well handled. Uh, the second, I think, is just, yeah, getting that feedback from uh, other folks, particularly and oh, sharing yeah. that with BMWG is going to be helpful because I, my guess is that the thing we're going to struggle with as a working group is particularly uh, you had a, a set of results here. When I see height in kilometers, that breaks my brain in, in a lab environment, N not because we can't have distance to your point in long cables, but the, I would imagine the concerns that I have with a very long cable on the ground is distinctly different than I'd have in height across air um, with a different signal. And so I certainly understand why you might have different kilometers measured here, but I still struggle a little bit with how you're going to, with a, with clarity list those in a lab because I can imagine there are a, a, any number of factors that might impact the performance that you'd see on any given day and, and I know you mentioned a couple the angle of the satellite the azimuth for example but weather conditions uh, might be another sandstorms in the desert fire smoke and smog in the air from the fires that seem to be going on everywhere do those things again they, there's just unique factors that don't play when you were running a physical cable underground or underwater, for example. So I think just us getting our heads around, hey, what and how does this translate to a lab? I think once the working group is able to uh, be comfortable with it, then I think we're going to be in a better position to take the work on and adopt it. And, and it's not meant to discourage you at all. I, again, I'm very fascinated by your work. Ever since you first brought it in in 112, uh, I'm excited to see what you're doing with it. And I'm excited to see what you're learning and sharing with us. And thank you for coming back and, and giving us the updates. I appreciate them. Uh, there's somebody in the, the Carson story is in the queue. Yes, yes. Uh, this is Carsten from, ENTC, Carsten from ENTC, a test lab in, in Germany. And uh, actually it's a great work item. I really like it. Would be great to, to contribute or review it to it. I don't want to promise too much. Uh, so as a test lab, we have conducted uh, satellite performance tests in the past with leading with a leading Western satellite provider. I cannot name it because it's unpublished. But um, in, actually, it's easier than one might think because there were specialized emulators. Of course, uh, getting real transponder capacity mm -hmm. is quite expensive, mm -hmm. especially if you want to run performance tests. So that's often out of question. I'm, I would be interested to see if the, the lab network from China Mobile, uh, the, the satellite network from China Mobile or China Telecom, or whatever you said, is would, would have this capability. But generally speaking, there are set professional like satellite emulators that emulate the transponder cap capability. And in the end, traditional satellites are very straightforward devices. They basically bit, bit relay things. You know, you, they don't do anything uh, except just taking the data and forwarding it. Yeah. But I'm not sure if Starlink or Kuiper or Telesat are operating the same way. So that would be one, they are, they are mostly like they have a mesh and they also are layer three aware or at least layer two aware, I believe, I'm not sure. So we would need to figure out, do we need to have a satellite vendor specific methodology or can we have a general methodology? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the questions I have. The other one is the focus of the draft that you're aiming for. Is it more about forwarding performance, like throughput or throughputs at scale, like single user or overall across all users? Or is it more about routing scalability and resiliency? Because that, that's actually an area where the ITF is doing a lot of work in uh, satellite ready routing topologies. Or the last of the three options, is it really just to prove comparability of the emulated container-based scenario with a real satellite network, right? Because that slide you're currently still showing it explains the, the dimensioning of the container-based emulation environment. It could also be a goal for the draft to just to like, we can represent a global satellite network by implementing it this way with containers. Um, just two more comments. Um, one, there just coincidentally has been a report published by the Network Working Group on July 5th, 
which uh, focuses the problems and requirements of satellite constellations for internet. It's authored by Future Way and China Mobile. And also um, in the last slide, you listed that there are two drafts uh, you're referring to, and one of them has expired, the SIC draft. And are both of them valid or is one the successor of the other? Sorry, um, Joel Yegley. Uh, so uh, I think it's definitely observable that atmospheric con conditions, among other things, um, are pretty easily parameterized. Like we build sort of detailed models for these and they can be emulated either in software or uh, elsewhere. This is a lot actually like ter terrestrial systems. So I, I think there's very there's a lot of useful work that can be done there. Uh, the other convenience thing, of course, with altitude here is that the speed of light actually is the speed of light, unlike on the ground here where we deal with like 0.68 or 0.7 C. So th that's actually like super convenient. So um, yeah, I, 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 think, I think this is like, I, I wouldn't say this stuff is easy to describe, but we have uh, all the physics experience and the, and the the tools necessary to characterize it and model it and even emulate it. Because like a lot of these things involve uh, emulating delay, which is something that we're super familiar with doing in the <laughs> benchmarking case already. So yeah, I think that, I think this is a, this is a great space. Yeah. So Sarah Banks is a participant. I'll follow on and say, Hey, I'm being a little gentle here. I think one of the things that the draft could uh, use is some of that how that Joel was just describing. It sort of jumps right into implementation um, without any of the, the, the sort of setup that would help folks understand, oh yeah, yeah this is easily described uh, because you described it. So again, I'm happy to share this with you on the list because I think uh, three folks just dropped a lot of words uh, all at once and I realize we're probably speaking uh, fast as well. Uh, so I'd encourage Karsten and Joel as well to drop your, well, I'll drop your comments if Joel doesn't, he might not, <laughs> but Karsten and I will drop the comments for this on the list uh, for you guys to take a look at and, and circle back on and, and see, hey, maybe you disagree and, or maybe you do agree and you take some of that. Um, but I think, uh, yes, and thank you for sharing this again. Uh, I'm really excited to see this go on. I really hope you guys continue to come back and share and, uh, I'm really interested in some of the answers to Karsten's questions actually too. So I'm looking forward to seeing this continue on the list. Oh, okay. okay. So a quick review. Uh, I, we, okay, we, okay, I, I'll stop here, right? <laughs> and oh, uh, I didn't, yeah, I didn't, I'm sorry. I was just making sure I didn't cut you off. I wasn't intending to cut you off. We, we do have to get to uh, uh, Vladimir's presentation, but you were at the end, correct? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so okay. we, uh, okay. I look forward to, 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 to answering this on, on the list and, uh, and for sure we, and all of, or 99% we will be at uh, 118 at the Prague at, uh, in person, and uh, we, are, we are happy to, to talk and to discuss there. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. All right. For our last presentation of the day, we have results. Um, not that I'm at all super excited by this. Um, Vladimir, are you, are you, oh, hello. Good evening. We can hear you, sir. Can you, you hear me? Mind? Yes. Okay, great. Always a uh, nervous breakdown to figure out if the microphone is working. Uh, yeah, so you have the slides. Uh, I'm going quickly through them because I know the quality is not great for the audio. Uh, we do have uh, some results which are uh, much more meaningful than what we used to have before. Like we, we, we try to make a simple case of testing a very popular network equipment that is can relate to what people so they can see the uh, the value and in, rise the interest in the, the work. So if you go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, 
no, no major breakthroughs, but we separated the Python script that is using uh, the model to configure the traffic generator and analyzer nodes to a separate uh, repository. So it's much clearer what uh, it in includes and to make revisions of this if any changes are there. It's not part of the, the big framework that it was part before so this is a good thing to mention that's the link uh, we have two implementations that work at the moment one is completely software based which is uh, alike the uh, iperf implementation which uses a delay to to space the packets introduce introduce uh, interframe gaps and this is working well for low speeds, like you can get approximately relevant results at 10, uh, 10 base T or something like that. And we have a hardware implementation which uh, uses a, a FPGA. We have an open source very well code that runs under the, the model. So when you configure that traffic generator with this open hardware, you get uh, very precise uh, hardware tester for uh, one gigabit Ethernet. And lately we have been looking into doing a very simple hardware 10 base T device implementation without a fee. Uh, so we are uh, bit banging with a small FPGA, the, the bits on a T base T device and generating a very precise timed packets. So this is like uh, not complete work, this work in progress, but we, we work partially on this, on these hackathons. And uh, the, the new thing is the test reports, which are organized in Git repositories uh, for a limited uh, amount of devices and setups. But uh, you can find the links part of these uh, slides. Uh, so if you're interested into to, to figure out how these reports compare to a commercial tester doing the same device in the test. And this is very useful to see that it actually does produce uh, very close results, if not better. So, uh, yeah, if you go now further, this is the ITF 116 hackathon report, which I added without any modification to this uh, presentation. So the, the project is based on this draft and the work uh, is approximately to do what IV, uh, interchangeable virtual instrument uh, class specification does for, for test instruments in a lab, but do it with Young and NetConf. So if you have been in contact with people doing testing using WAPView, they have these models from the 70s that make the instruments appear uh, identical. Like you can buy a, a oscilloscope from a different providers and you have this interface that your test will work with either of them and will produce the same results. This was never done for uh, network testers. So this is what this draft is about. Do this with Young and NetConf. If you are not interested in Young and NetConf, but you think you might be interested this is a good place to start because it's uh, something very practical and relevant and easy to to get started with so the test script which i think is also the the for newcomers in this work uh, there are a lot of implementations as RFC 2544, but none is open source. And this, this one is, and it's a Python script that uses uh, an API to Young and NetConf. So it sends NetConf packets configuring these devices to generate packets and measure delays and packet loss. Uh, that's, that's working, and this is what we used for, to get the results. Uh, now, on the device side, this is the client side. The device side, we have uh, the young NetConf server and the implementations that run under it. I'm not going to go into detail. I have done it several times, but you can find the links here. And if you go to the next slide to 
quickly wrap it. Vla this is Vla Vladimir. I'm sorry to interrupt. Just a time check. You have four minutes left. Yeah, I'm. I'm totally within. Uh, this is a detailed uh, tree showing the implementation with links to all the repositories. So I'm not going to go into the details here. I have done it several times, maybe. So this is included if you are interested. And if you go to the next one. Yes, this is how the hardware-based version of the open source hardware implementation looks like. And uh, we're, we're adding features. Now, now it is not supporting the multi-stream version, but it is completely supporting the single stream uh, basic version, which is enough for RFC 2455 uh, and many other tests and benchmarks. Uh, if you go to the next one, yeah, uh, one advantage, one advantage is when, when you use Young and NetConf interface for your network tester and you have a Young and NetConf interface for your oscilloscope, uh, power supply and uh, all kinds of devices that create uh, different environment changes. It speeds up the development of tests and benchmarks, which are more complex than just that. So if you want to or the increasing your productivity. So here we show our setup, which which uses the oscilloscope, which is also controlled with the uh, Uh, network programmability approach. So that's it. And uh, this is the test device. If you see the small switch up there that we're going to have the reports for. Uh, better picture on the next slide. Two minute warning. Yeah. So the test results are for four devices in the test. One is uh, optical uh, modules which gives fastest latency. Uh, one is with the conversion to Ethernet modules, which introduce several microseconds of latency. Then you have a chip switch, which uh, is connected without any manage management configuration, but gives 100% bandwidth. And the same chip switch with the configuration to, to, to reduce the bandwidth. Uh, traffic policing configured in, which greatly affects the performance as we have all experienced. So these are the reports here. And if you are interested in working into the details, you can check them out. They match the report acquired with the, like uh, industrial uh, commercial tester, which we compare with. So if you go to the next slide, this is like the commercial test that we used. I'm not going to say anything about it. So probably several other testers that can be used as well and produce similar results. But we, we documented these results and added them to the repositories so you can compare with them. And these are the numbers probably which uh, are not relevant because they are for, uh, like a specific uh, hardware and a device, but uh, comparing the results that we got with the commercial tester and our implementation using Young and NetConf, it, it were, they, they were uh, negligent deviations. And probably ours was uh, more precise, if, if you ask me. <laughs> yeah, so next one. I think I'm done. I don't think there's, yes, this is the end. We have one question, uh, if you talk really slow but fast. Sure, it was mostly just a comment. I'd seen this on 96 boards, the um, six SFP board thing, but I hadn't actually put the name together with you, so I didn't realize it was you. That's really cool. Just a comment. Thanks. Uh, well, I think there are too few people using this because it is uh, 
something that I think is going to help a lot of companies that need something like that. We were at this stage, and that's where this work started, both with Young and NetConf and uh, this hardware project. So if you are in this position, just take a look into it, and it's open source. It's not uh, no hoops attached. Thank you. Thank you for presenting that, Vladimir. I appreciate it. Thanks. So, uh, <clears throat> first time, uh, my myself and, and Al posthumously uh, have chaired in four years in person, and we're finishing right on time. So, I want to say thanks to everybody. Thanks for sharing your words of kindness on and off the list. Thanks for folks including things in their slides. Uh, it's been a super interesting meeting. Um, I do want to give you guys the heads up that after this meeting on the list, I'll be introducing a new co-chair with me who happens to be in the room. I'm going to totally embarrass him and have him stand up. Giuseppe Fiocola is going to be joining me uh, after this meeting. Um, Warren's going to push the button and make it so. <laughs> yes, go right ahead. He's pushing it now. Um, so please, uh, you know, extend a warm welcome to him. I think it's tough to come into i as a chair who's been here for 10 years without i've been here 15 but 10 without i found this super strange to do because al just had such a a well polished and thoughtful routine to share uh so i found it strange i can only imagine what it's like to be a participant and come in and, and fill those shoes but um i'm here to support i think all of us are here to support we're a very kind working group right uh, we have a pretty awesome AD. We, we continue to get lucky with our string of ADs. Um, so welcome. I'll send the, the note down on the list here in just a sec. Thank you, folks. Thanks for a good meeting. And I, I just want to say that it's an honor for me to be doing the work of Mark. It was one of the first times in my life when I had the idea to try to make the idea. So it's an honor to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, folks. Have a good rest of the week. No blue sheets to turn in anymore since you're on the front, right? Anymore. It's all cheap, yeah. If you are married, you can turn. Perfect. So it's all good. Thank you. Uh, I can keep the button.